Boom. There we go. Thank you. Though I am getting some nice comments now. You can hear me now. Don't worry. Um, thank you for the compliments, though. Now, now i got to like restart this. Absolutely no twerking going on. Um, so I was starting off before I realized that there were no... Um, <laughs> There was no audio. The number one trending topic on Twitter this morning was the Great Recession, which is what we are talking about today. This is, I mean, what a semester to be taking this class, everybody. What a time to be alive, or at least away from disease. Man, do, do you guys get tired of me complaining every single time how much I wish that we were in person for this lecture um, because it just, there are so many parts of this that are more important to be able to convey to you in person than what I can do on a lecture. Um, but we're going to try anyway. So let's go ahead, jump in, get you a little bit of big picture stuff before we re really get into the explanations of what is going on here. So, this is real GDP from 2000 and 2018. You can see real GDP means it's adjusted for inflation. I know we haven't really talked about that, but you know, since this is basically the last lecture of the semester, hopefully you know that. <laughs> Here we go. You have economic growth going, and you have it like pretty consistent throughout the entire period, except for right there, 2008 to 2009, you have this little dip in what's going on. Um, that is the recession. That is what you have lived through. All of you taking this class have lived through it. Now, you might not remember it clearly, though I imagine you remember some things specifically. Here is the unemployment rate. Um, and it, it just it just kept going up from 2008 to 2010. Going into it, we were, let's see, we were just under 5%, and then we had this large increase in unemployment that peaked at about at 10% at the beginning of 2010. Now, obviously, we're already going into the parts where we're intersecting with what's going on today, where we're seeing so many unemployment claims. We're seeing historic numbers there. The issue with the comparison with today and past in the past, hopefully today 
is a short spell of unemployment. Back here, these are really large spells of unemployment. These are people stuck in unemployment, and it's just awful. You probably have an experience with this. You probably, your parents certainly have an experience with this. Let me tell you a story. I have two marriage stories to tell you. One today, one Tuesday. Now, as you know, I got married, well, I got engaged pretty quickly, about six weeks after the first date with my now wife. Um, we had we had met before. We both took trips uh, to Orlando, Florida, and we had met. And as I had told you before, we sat next to each other on the airplane, got home, and talked. So then when I brought up this discussion with my parents about wanting to get married so quickly, I knew that there were going to be some objections. You know, it, naturally. Maybe not as, like, at the time... I probably didn't anticipate too many. Now, you know, looking back on this 11 years later, I'm like, what in the heck was I thinking? No, if my kids did that, of course I'd be going crazy thinking about it. At the time, it felt like, oh, yeah, we've got enough time. We, we've totally known it. But, you know, now it's like it would, it would be weird if my kid came home and said that. So I'm going on a walk around my parents' neighborhood and we're talking about this, I, this prospect of me getting married. And there are so many objections that my parents can bring up about whether I get married or not. Now, again, this is 11 years ago, so we're in 2009. 2009 is right up here on this unemployment part. Um, and I was like totally oblivious to what was going on at this point because I left for my trip in 2007, when things were back at their low, it literally at the lowest part of this graph is when I left. I come back when they're nearly at their highest point. Okay, so I'm totally oblivious. Obviously, I'd seen kind of like signs that things were happening, but just not, just not really in touch with what's going on. So I didn't realize what was going on in the world, where my par parents' world were, all these things. So. They had so many opportunities, so many things that they could say to object. But the one that sticks with me, the one that I remember to this day, is that my mom, they, they start re revealing to me that they're having difficulties because of the recession, um, which is not unexpected. My dad was a mortgage broker, so you know you know, understand there's a housing crisis and all this. So obviously he had trouble with that, uh, with jobs because of this. So then my mom, her biggest objection that stands out to me was she said, I don't, we don't even have enough money that I could buy a dress to go to your wedding. Like I just don't even have that much. And that, that stuck with me to this day, just like that's what recessions do. That's the human cost there, right? Like that's when things just really hit and are so so personal, right? Like we look at these numbers and it's important for us to be able to step back and look at these numbers to understand what's going on, to understand the magnitude of what's going on, right? We can't always get caught up in the small details. But the small details can be really important for us to understand just how devastating these things can be. You know, obviously the Great Depression, much bigger than what this was, but we don't have people, uh, I mean, there are a few people who were alive during the Great Depression, remember it, but to have that personal touch, to understand what was going on during the recession for my family, that, that just made all the difference. I'm sure you have those stories, um, some of you might remember the recession vividly. You might remember what your parents were going through, what your family was going through at this time. Some of you might have been a little insulated from it, but your parents will still have stories. Um, many of you are back home now. If you're not back home now, I'm sure you'll be, be returning home in the next week or two as school closes out. I encourage you to talk to your parents 
and saying like, what was it like living through this? How, what was it was, did it feel the same in 2007, 2008 as it feels right now? Like what are the differences? How, where do you think things are? Um, I think today we are in, uh, a totally different situation than we were, we would be if we had not had 2007. We learned a lot from 2007, 2008, and that allowed us to respond differently today. Great question in the chat. How did I have money to buy an engagement ring? Um, the nice thing is she had inherited an engagement ring from her, uh, grandmother, a great grandmother. Didn't have to buy one. Uh, and you know, that, that, that factored into the economics of whether we should get married. Oh, I don't have to buy a ring. Sold. Okay. So the big questions we have here is what happened with the Great Recession? Again, you've lived through this. Maybe you don't quite understand what happened here. Maybe you don't quite understand. Like, you know there's something with housing. You know there's un high unemployment. Well, like, what really happened there? And it's tough to really disentangle everything because it is like a pretty complicated story. We're going to try to get through it. We're going to try to understand. But we want to make sure that we understand the major developments that happened at the Federal Reserve since the Great Depression. Because remember, Great Depression, Federal Reserve drops the ball. And Federal Reserve plays a major part in this story as well. We want to know how did we go from the Federal Reserve we had during the Great Depression to the Federal Reserve we had in 2007-2008. Why was the housing market so important to the crisis? We want to understand that connection. Then what were the big events during the recession? What happened in the aftermath? We want to understand how all these pieces come together. Um, this is a really complex, complicated story. We obviously will not be able to do justice to the entire story in this lecture. But I hope to give you some of the big points. I hope for you to come away from this lecture with at least some things that you can tell people and understand, like, this is how things are similar. This is how things are different. Now, right as uh, everything was happening like a month ago, I put out that video, what are the differences between today and 2008? It's obviously not totally up to date because I did this right before everything really crashed down. Um, but I still think a lot of those points hold true. So you can look at that as well as see some comparisons. What major developments happened at the Federal Reserve since the Great Depression? So in 1963, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz published this book, The Monetary History of the United States. This was a major tome. I mean, you can see how big this thing is just from this picture. It was, as far as I know, the first to argue that the Great Depression was caused by monetary problems. Now, we talked about that. We talked about the issues with uh, deflation. We talked about the issues with the gold standard causing that deflation, with money being too tight at the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve not acting. Those are Most of those arguments are coming from this book. And it changed the way people thought about the Fed. They realized that it had power to shape the economy, that by pulling this monetary policy lever, the Federal Reserve could do more for the economy. And our perceptions of what the Federal Reserve could do have been further shaped by what happened after 1960. So here are three former chairs of the Federal Reserve. You have Ben Bernanke, who is the chair during the Great Recession. Before him, you have Alan Greenspan. And then before him, you have Paul Volcker. Paul Volcker was a giant. I mean, look at him. He is like a head taller than both these guys. He just passed away about a year ago. Um, I want to go through and just kind of hit the major points of what happened during Volcker and then Greenspan because understanding what happened during those two will help you understand what Bernanke was at when he comes into the Fed in 2006 and is in that position when the recession hits. Fun fact, the federal chair height is correlated with interest rates. Paul Walker was very tall and he had high interest rates. Interest rates went low as Federal Reserve chairs got shorter. Janet Yellen, who is the first woman to be the chair of the Federal Reserve, had the lowest interest rates. And up until five weeks ago, interest rates were a little bit higher with Jay Powell, the current chair of the Federal Reserve. They have since 
dropped significantly. <laughs> so this correlation was going pretty well and then kind of broke five weeks ago. So sad. But fun fact, fun fact that you can somehow correlate the height of the federal chairs of the Federal Reserve with the interest rate. Uh, oh, that's definitely an out-of-date federal funds rate. Okay, inflation during the 1960s and 1970s. So this is, we're going to talk about how Volcker comes into the Federal Reserve. Inflation is high in the 1960s. Several factors leading to this. You have these large tax cuts, uh, getting money out there. You have expansionary monetary policy. You have low unemployment. Uh, you have government spending for the Vietnam War. You just have all these factors pushing up inflation. And in the 1970s, Nixon tries to limit inflation through price and wage controls. And the Federal Reserve engaged in contractionary monetary policy. Now, remember, contractionary monetary policy, we talked about this with the Great Depression. Contractionary monetary policy is when you take money out of the system that's going to increase interest rates and that's going to decrease inflation. They're trying to do a contractionary monetary policy. But the price controls and the monetary policy really didn't have that large of an effect. Then, in the mid-1970s, OPEC limited oil production and caused the price of oil to quadruple. Taking an economics class today, if you've taken like a macro class or basically anything where you go through supply and demand and they talk about oil shocks, it's because oil shocks played such a big role in the 1970s. So many of these economists lived through those. They want you to understand like, yeah, we, we know we can explain exactly what happened in the 1970s through just simple economics. You have restriction in supply, price goes up, boom. That's why you see oil shocks so much, and that's why you've grown to love them. Well, this, this is a huge shock. Price of oil quadruples. Well, the price of oil is an important input to so many other factors of production, right? You know, driving our cars, uh, factories, just... Uh, uh, a lot of the products that we consume are oil by byproducts. You have all these factors coming into, um, you have the, sorry, Cartel, the band, did sponsor OPEC. Uh, great band, by the way. Good collaboration with Wyclef. So because oil is such an important input to all these things, you see inflation just skyrocket. Um, but not only is inflation high, you have low growth. This is called stagflation because it's stagnant inflation. Normally, some inflation, as we've talked about before, will lead to growth, right? We talked about this with the, um, uh, the, kind of the Chuck E. Cheese model, right? Give them a few more tickets every time they play a game. Those tickets will inspire people to keep coming and they'll buy more stuff. But then eventually, you'll, uh, you'll have to raise prices and things level out. There was no growth associated with this. There was stagnant growth, high inflation. This is the worst thing that could be happening at this time. Here is a graph of inflation over time, starting in 1960, 1960 itself. And you see this is the inflation rate each year. So this isn't even like the total of effect of inflation. This is just the change every year. And you just see inflation going up and up and up. You have this uh, recession right here. Every gray shaded part is a recession. And then Paul Walker comes in in the 19, late 1970s, and suddenly we see this big drop in inflation rates. What happened? Why do we see this huge drop in inflation? Why was something that seemed to be going out of control suddenly reined in? Well, Walker becomes chair of the Federal Reserve in 1979. And during his confirmation hearing, he clearly announces that his top priority will be fight, fighting inflation by controlling the money supply. People didn't realize the extent to which this needed to happen. And Volcker just had this vision. He said, this is what we need to do. We need to rein in inflation through the money supply. And that's my plan. He gets in and he tightens the money supply. And the federal funds rate goes up to 20%. 20%. I mean, the federal funds rate, basically in your lifetime, has been less than 2%. It is, I just can't even imagine a 20% federal funds rate. I talked to my uh, dad a year ago or so, asked him about mortgage rates on the first house he bought. He talked about the insane mortgage rates. Like when we bought our first house, 
the rate was around 3%, and I know that he was paying at least 12% interest on his first house. But that's because interest rates account for inflation, and they account for the federal funds rate, right? So what Volcker does is he just... He, I mean, this is contractionary policy to the max. Let's just restrict how much money there is and let's make sure that inflation is reined in. Well, what's going to happen if you take all that money out of the economy? You're going to raise interest rates as interest rates go up. Business activity is going to go down. This triggers a recession. And citizens and politicians from all over the spectrum are calling for Volcker's job. Like, you are causing a recession. This is hurting people. We need to get out of this. But within two years, inflation drops from 12% to about 3.7%. Nobody thought this was possible. People are like, "There's." if you had told somebody in 1978 that you would be able to rein in inflation from 12% all the way down to less than 4%, people would be like, you're crazy. There's no way we're going to be able to solve this problem that quickly. Volcker does it through the Federal Reserve and through monetary policy. And this really goes to show the importance of the independence of the Federal Reserve and the political independence. People, like Volcker understands what needs to happen, and he goes and he does it. And even though there are so many people telling him, like, you're hurting our country by doing this, Yes, in the short run, there was a recession, but in the long run, this was much better than continuing to go through all this inflation. They, like The country had been hurt for years because of this high inflation. And so to just say, let's cut this off, go through the pain in the first two years, and then be back to normal, much better place. So it's a good thing that they, we have political independence. And that's the same thing with today. Today, Jerome Powell, he's like, Hey, we have this problem. We have this. We have a, an impending recession. We know that businesses are going to have a hard time getting through this. Yeah, Congress is going to drag their feet, but you know what? We don't have to. We can just act immediately. And the Federal Reserve has been on the ball and ahead of the curve on so many aspects of this. And that's because they're politically independent and they can act really rapidly. So this is... I mean, there are just so many reasons why we need a politically independent Federal Reserve. Um, so then Volcker's time as the chair of the Federal Reserve really cements our understanding of the power of the Federal Reserve, that the Federal Reserve can actually affect the economy, that their policy can actually direct the, the, where things are going. Which leads us to Alan Greenspan. He succeeds... Volcker. He takes the Fed chair in 1987, and soon after he takes the job, he definitely handles a stock market crash and instantly becomes a hero. So, uh, is it in 87 or maybe 88? There's a stock market crash. We make it through it pretty well. Not a huge crash for us. And largely attributed to Greenspan reacting properly, you know, lowering interest rates, making sure money was out there. Um, he seemed to immediately just win people over with his understanding of economic policy. But then furthermore, he had this penchant for media. He dated Barbara Walters, and he later married journalist Andrea Mitchell. So the, like, he understands journalism. He understands um, optics, I would say. He's charismatic. He's able to... Uh, be around these high-profile people. Um, we're getting a lot of video buffers, I see. Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I'm getting a little warning, and I don't know how to stop that, especially we have shut down everything. I'm the only one using the Internet right now. But, you know, that's... Thanks, Comcast. Okay. So, Greenspan understands optics. He's very good at corresponding with the media. And he managed the economy under some really intense times. 1987 stock market crash, like I mentioned. The fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Two U.S. wars with Iraq. 9-11. China coming onto the scene. Like, just so many things happen while Greenspan is in there. And the U.S. just manages to handle it pretty well. Takes it on pretty well. And so... Um, super. La I'm getting another comment on super laggy. I don't know if there's anything I can do to fix that. I'm really sorry. I don't. Uh, 
I don't even know if I can adjust my settings at all. Um, I think that's just an internet provider thing right now. I'm really sorry about that. So as a result of how well things go during his tenure, in 2006, he just retires at the top of his game, and he is a superstar. Here is um, a Sim- – this is from the Simpsons comic book, not the Simpsons TV show. But it's Alan Greenspan versus The Thing, right? Like that's when you know you've made it is when you get referenced in a uh, in a Simpsons thing, right? Like, oh, you've been – You've had an actual depiction of you on The Simpsons. You are there. You're solid. So he he's just a star. He is a super superstar after the uh, his time. And because of it, because of Volker, because of Greenspan, we understand that the chair, the chair of the Federal Reserve, just has lots of power. Okay, markets respond to that information, and they were carefully monitoring the Fed chair. What everything that the chair says, they want to say, like investors want to say, oh, he said this word, whatever it was. I, I don't know. Things are looking fine. Well, he said fine instead of great or super. So fine means that it's might might not be as good as we thought. Maybe we should change our investments as a result. So now all of a sudden the chair of the Federal Reserve has to be really careful about what they say because they don't want to trigger the market to do something crazy as a result of just like a stray word. So Greenspan understands his power and he starts creating this intentionally vague language to prevent the market from overreacting. It came to be called Fed speak or green speak. Like he would say, I don't even have an example of Fed speak or green speak. I should go and find examples of that. That would be good. Where people, like, it would be really hard to understand exactly what he thought about the economy from what he said um, because he doesn't want markets to react, which, I mean, I see the virtues of it at the same time causes lots of problems. So today... Because no one wants, because the Federal Reserve doesn't want to be responsible for disseminating bad information, you could actually, you, you, they basically put every statement from the Federal Reserve on, from anybody in the Federal Reserve Board on their website. Um, in fact, I wonder, no, went to the wrong website. Um, let me see if they've got things up right now because. You can get some really cool information off of this. Um, News and events. So I put the link right there if you want to see their speeches. If you're interested in understanding current economic problems, then going to this website is fantastic. Right now they have, uh, this video is a week old. Um, But Jerome Powell is talking about the economy today. It's a video. You can see what his opinion is. I mean, it's great. It's a great way, a great resource to stay up to date on good takes with regard to the economy today. Um, Okay. I am getting like super varied rates on my streaming. I understand that it's laggy and it would just drive me crazy if I was watching this lecture as well with how laggy it is. Don't know how what I can do to fix it because I think it's a ISP problem. Um, it might be because it snowed. How miserable is it that it snowed today? At least most of it has melted now, but <laughs> it is just you wake up and you see the world covered in snow. And you're like, really, just one more thing, huh? Um, yeah, so I'm getting just like super varied rates on this. Um, Someone's asking what was the website. It's right there at the bottom of this slide. So if you have the slide uh, on Canvas, it's Federal Reserve. Oh, I'm moving it instead of resizing it. Federalreserve.gov slash news events slash speeches. I noticed that they do have something from a week ago. Oh, now, okay. But it's not 
as updated as it normally is because things are going so crazy right now. I think they just haven't been making that many speeches. Um, can I lower the video quality from right here? Let me see if I can lower the video quality. Um, let's see. I don't want the bit rate. I want... Yeah, I don't know how to lower the bit rate on... Um, on the software. Yeah, they're not letting me. I don't see it right there. For the sake of time. Man. We're seeing, yeah, I'm seeing lots of drop frames. Like a fifth of these are drop frames. Let me quickly see. Um, if there's a solution to this, because I think the taking a minute to see if I can improve the quality of the stream is going to be worth it if we can improve um, the quality of the stream over the long run. Um, do I do it through YouTube itself? Um, additional settings. Just imagine this like when I just take so long trying to find something. I feel bad. I'm going to lose all of you. Put something in the chat. Let's see. I don't have even a... Ooh. I hope I didn't stop the stream by doing that. Mm -hmm. Nope. Okay. I'm not seeing it on YouTube. I'm trying to see if I can find it. Yeah, man. I can even see the lag. Right there, let's see. Um, I know everybody was like, yes, I took all this time out of my day so that way I could sit here and watch Professor Paulson look at settings for his streaming. Okay. I'll try lowering the bit rate just a bit and see if that helps. I don't know how much it's going to help, guys. I'm sorry. I hope it does. Um, this, you know. Okay. Oh, yeah, still says I'm having troubles with the stream. Um, okay. Well, just like in class, I tend to glitch up on you. I will be glitching up here. It says my stream's coming through a little healthier right now. No one knows. All right. That is the history of the Federal Reserve going. So th that gives you a little bit of the progression from the Great Depression to 2006, let's say. Because, again, Great Depression, Fed totally drops the ball. We learn a lot. That brings us to 2006. Greenspan, although he had retired at like just the peak. People love him. He's doing great. The economy is just booming. Now we kind of look to his legacy of having four failures. He kept interest rates too low for too long. Um, do I, I, didn't, I don't have the federal funds right here, but um, he, he just had the, he figured like, hey, let's experiment with having lower rates. Things seem to be going well. Let's experiment with lower rates and let's just see if we can keep the economy going and just get more growth as a result. But keeping interest rates too low encourages risky investment and risky investment plays a big role in what happens 
with the housing market. He, speaking of the housing market, he failed to act on the housing market. Now, he saw the ha- housing market as a froth versus a bubble. Okay, so you talk about, you've probably heard about asset bubbles. That's when an asset is overvalued relative to the fundamentals. We see like there, there's a fundamental value behind this asset. People are really excited to keep buying it. They, they drive up the price and then that bubble pops and the price returns back to the fundamental. Now, people were looking at housing and they realized, you know, it looks like housing prices are going really high. Greenspan sees this and he believes that it's not a bubble as much as it is a froth, which is a bunch of little bubbles. What's the difference? Well, we did the um, when we did that lecture where we talked about a house in um, Cache Valley versus a house in Palo Alto, and how the house that goes for two hundred thousand dollars here can go for five million dollars in Palo Alto. That's because housing is local. You can't move housing. Well, he thought that these bubbles were just local bubbles, that you might have a housing bubble pop in Palo Alto, but that bubble would not then go affect the uh, bubble in Logan. Logan's bubble would pop at a totally different time. That's what the froth is, right? You have all these little bubbles. They're all local. They're all happening across the country. They pop at different times. So he thinks... You know, we're not facing a national crisis if we have all these little bubbles spread out across the country. And he also believed in a mop up after strategy, which is, you know, if we act too soon, this, you know, there are things that would get resolved themselves if we just let them go out. And it's better, Greenspan believed, to just come in afterwards and say, okay, now that the chips have fallen where they will, let's clean this up and mop up after what happened here. Um, so that he doesn't act on the housing market and he doesn't regulate subprime lending. We're going to talk about what subprime lending is in just a few slides, but this is most of the lending was outside of the Fed's regulatory reach. He didn't act to adjust those regulations. He didn't really do anything to say, this is how we're going to fix this, uh, this looming problem. Um, and some people believe he put too much faith in the market to police itself. Uh, he was much more libertarian leaning. He believed that markets solved themselves. And so he, he was very anti-regulation. And in some respects, that's fine. In other respects, that can lead to problems. Uh, so let's talk about the shadow banking system. So sir, term shadow banking makes it sound nefarious, right? Maybe it's even illegal. Oh, shadow banking, this sounds like the black market. This sounds like things going on behind the scenes. Some would say, yeah, that's exactly what shadow banking is. But that's not what we mean when we mean shadow banking. The term applies to important financial institutions that do perform essential functions. But they're institutions that are just not commercial banks. They're outside of the regulatory reach. They're in the shadow of regulation. They're not seen. So again, commercial banks are things like Wells Fargo, Deseret, uh, Zions Bank. They're, they're these banks that you think of when you go and you bank. The shadow banks are things like Goldman Sachs, which still exists today, right? Goldman Sachs. I don't know how much Goldman Sachs has changed. I should look into what the changes have happened since 2008, but definitely in 2006, Goldman Sachs was a shadow bank. They were outside of the regulation of the Federal Reserve, and their activities just weren't always on the radar of the Federal Reserve. That is what the shadow bank is referencing. We saw things like this during the panic of 1907. I didn't preface this way. One of the things that's great about the Great Recession, after we've talked about the panic of 1907 and the Great Depression, is that we know so, like, once you know those two things, like, so many of the parallels just, like, fit in. It's so easy to see the patterns of what's going on with this. It's it's crazy. So, shadow banks are like the trusts during the panic of 1907. They were unregulated, and they were growing quickly, okay? It's just this really large fast-growing financial institution that is just outside of 
regulations, which means they might be taking riskier things, but really just the central authorities don't know what's going on. Okay, let's talk about leverage for a second, just so you understand what this term means. We talked about this in the 1920s. We've talked about leverage. You know, this is the stock market going into uh, through the 1920s was highly leveraged. Remember, we talked about margin pur- purchases. When people bought stocks using a small amount of cash, they took out huge loans to get and use that debt to buy um, to buy those stocks. And they had put down just a little bit of money, and then they took out huge loans. And so they were highly leveraged, is what we'd say. Leverage is the size of your debt relative to your equity. Um, let, you can think about it as um, I mean, like a lever, right? The When you have a lever and you have this fulcrum out all the way up to the left, you can have this small amount of uh, equity and this really large amount of debt, okay? So, but you can get all that debt because you're using, you have the, you're really leveraged. You can have this lever to get you over and allow you to lift that. There's your physics lessons for today. So if you put down 20% on a house, that's like, that's not, I wouldn't say a typical down payment, but that is, you know, historically a typical down payment is to put 20% down on your house, and then you borrow the remaining 80%. Your leverage ratio is four. You have 80% debt relative to the 20% equity. If you put 10% down on your house, you borrow the remaining 90%, your leverage ratio is nine, 90 to 10. In the 1920s, the stock market was highly leveraged. In the 2000s, the housing market was highly leveraged. Okay, that's a parallel that we're seeing between these two time periods. Well, how did the market become so leveraged? It comes through subprime loans. Now, home ownership for low income households is like, it's just been this long standing policy goal that, and it makes sense, right? Like, we even talk about it today. You know, we want low-income households to be able to own their house. We don't want them. We want them to be able to build equity in those homes, um, not necessarily paying landlords or you know they don't have to pay rent. We want them to just own those homes. But there are four barriers to getting low-income households to owning homes. They don't have money for a down payment because they're low income. They don't have credit history, um, or you know possibly they have problematic credit history. Right? Like they haven't made these kind of purchases in the past. So it's hard for them to get low um, low interest rates when they buy their homes. Um, there's no proof of income often. Like their jobs, they might not just have the type of jobs that prove that they have the income that they can to pay off these loans. And there's just other information problems. Like is this somebody that we can rely on? Is this somebody that we want to give a loan to? Just so many problems there. Subprime loans were a new type of loan that allowed low-income households to buy the homes. And because these loans were targeted towards buyers who couldn't afford a down payment, they required almost nothing down. And so they were highly leveraged loans, right? Like, if you're... This is just this conundrum, right? Like, it's just really interesting to think about how people will sometimes view these because they're like, oh, subprime loans, they're predatory, they're targeted towards low-income. Like, if you want low-income people to own a home, you have to come up with some sort of financial tool to allow them to own that home. Like these homes, they're scarce resources. They have prices. You can't just like print new homes. We need a way to get those to people. And so we need to come up with financial instruments to get them. And this financial instrument happens to be one where you don't put that much money down on the home because the people you're targeting don't have that much money, right? Like this is a natural conclusion from what you're going to do. One of the, you know, you say, well, why do we even create something? Why do we let people be so leveraged like this? And it looks kind of like the 1920s. But with housing, it's even better than the stock market. Housing is just seen as this incredibly safe investment. And basically, people think house prices could rise, but they would never fall. And this is a very old belief. There's this phrase that's called, it's as safe as houses. You say like, oh yeah, that that investment, it's as safe as houses, right? That phrase existed 
in a dictionary in 1874, meaning it had very low risk. For a long, long time, we have believed houses don't bear that much risk. Not everybody is optimistic about housing. Bob Schiller, who was an econom- still is an economist at Yale, was tracking house prices, and he believed they were overpriced. And in 2013, he won a Nobel Prize for his insights on the psychology of finance called behavioral finance. Um, so this is his index. He said, you know, the, you see these waves coming through. Um, and then from the you know mid-90s up through 2005, you see this big upswing in housing prices. And this is Schiller saying, it looks like there is a big bubble in housing. Like it doesn't feel like things should be increasing as quickly as they do. So why, how, how are people even able like to finance these things? Like who would say, yeah, we're going to lend money to people with basically no money holding on to a very valuable asset and we're just going to expect them to pay us back. Like, you need to get that money from somewhere, right? It's a lot of money, right? If housing prices are going up, you have a lot of money that you need to put down, or you need to borrow to finance that. So where does all this money come from and why are people willing to do this? Well, the key is that individual loans were risky, but you can lower your risk by pooling the mortgages, okay? So let's say... You have, I mean, the whiteboard is just clutch, guys. Here you go. You have, we're going to have 10. Why not? Each of these borrowers has like a pretty high risk of defaulting. Okay. I mean, high is a relative term, right? Like a normal borrower has practically zero. Maybe they default at like 1%, which would be high but not crazy. Each of them ha- defaults at 1%. Okay, well, if I just take on one person, then that might be a risky investment. But if I could somehow finance all 10 of them, then yes, one of them might default, but the other nine are still good. And if, as long as those nine keep paying, if this guy drops out, that's fine. I'm still profitable. The rates that I've set, I can still be profitable at nine of these people lending and paying me back. But if this person does pay me back and doesn't, like, if he doesn't, default, if everybody's paying me back, it's even more profitable, right? It's like, it's great. It's great. But we're going to do these risk calculations to understand that, hey, we're going to pool all these things together to make sure that we can make money Basically, even if people are defaulting at higher rates, we're going to be able to spread that risk out. Sometimes we'll win, sometimes we'll lose, but on average, we're going to do pretty well. So investment banks are pooling these subprime loans, but then they would dice them up into different what we call mortgage-backed securities, okay? M-B-S, okay? Mortgage-backed security. Sam Merrill, I guess, because these are were clutch. I don't know. Sam Merrill, I don't know. You guys are from Utah State. So, I mean, I'm at Utah State too, but whatever. I love Utah State, by the way, guys. Totally planning on being here for a long, long time. Definitely up until next semester when you guys take my class. Okay. These are called mortgage-backed securities. What you would do, you'd have your initial pool I'm going to a grid system now. These are all the mortgages coming together. They're being pooled together. But then, it wasn't just pooling them. People would be like, well, let's cut off that part. Let's put that over here. And there's this other one over here Let that's all pooled together. Let's cut off this part, bring it here, and we're going to create a new thing right there. And when you do all this cut, slicing and dicing, you get to these points where these securities, they're pretty good investments. They have great returns. They hardly ever lose money. It's great. Like this, this is this new financial innovation that just seems to be making people tons of money. Even when people are defaulting on their loans, 
you're going to have things that turn out well. Um, someone asked, what else do I teach? I don't teach management. next. Well, I do teach my this management class next semester. I teach econ. You got to go, if you really want, you got to go look at ECN 3600. That is the class I'm teaching next semester. Putting all this together relies on two assumptions. First, your default risks are not correlated. Not correlated means one person defaulting is totally unrelated to another person defaulting. So going back, let's go back to our 10 guys. Oh, we have the money printer go burr meme in here. You guys are good following those. How widespread has that gotten? That started in econ Twitter, and it keeps going, so that's great. Okay, so we have these two. If this person defaults, as long as this person's risk is uncorrelated with everyone else, no problem. But if this person defaults, and because that person defaults, also other people start defaulting, that can be really bad. That means all of a sudden you, this instrument, this security goes bad really quickly. You want it that everybody's risk here is independent. That's how you're really pooling risk and diversifying. If everyone's falling together, that's terrible, right? So what you would want is something like w one lender in Logan and one lender in San Francisco, another lender in, or another borrower, these are all borrowers in New Orleans. They're spread out all over the country. And sure, something bad might happen in Logan, but that's probably not going to happen in New Orleans and San Francisco, so you're fine. Like, you wouldn't want to get 10 people from Cache Valley because if something bad happens in Cache Valley, all 10 of them are going to be affected. That's the idea between correlated, uncorrelated risks. Like, we don't want these risks correlated. And you want to be able to know which securities are risky. You want to know if something goes wrong, which things are the ones that are at risk and which ones are the ones that are safe. Because if you know which ones are safe, boom. Oh, I didn't realize that was open. Sorry for that ding, everybody. Um, so that, those are the keys behind making these mortgage-backed securities successful. Turns out neither of these was true. I like to think about this as lettuce. You could kind of think about it as what's going on today with self-isolation. Let me bring this up. Like, in this... Both these past two fall semesters, right before Thanksgiving, there's been a big lettuce scare where people think the, uh, where there's been confirmed cases that the lettuce has E. coli. Um, and then like no one was allowed to buy lettuce anymore. I don't know if you remember that. You can apply basically the same logic to self-isolation. But, you know, lettuce is grown all over the country. And imagine, and, you know, we get bags of chopped up lettuce brought in here, right? Now, usually when you get a bag of chopped up lettuce, it's coming from like one farm or one area. So like this isn't a perfect analogy, but imagine instead of coming from one farm, you just bring all the lettuce from the country, you put it in one central chopping up plant or, you know, a couple of, they're going all over the place. They get, you get lettuce from all over the country in each bag. Well, now if E. coli breaks out, which here's a little picture of an E. coli plushie, we had a, we had friends who gave their kid an E. coli plushie because they're biologists and they were weird. But there's an E. coli plushie. Not as cute as Baby Yoda. Sorry. If you have these, if you don't know which bags have E. coli on it, then you can't eat any of the lettuce, right? Just like if you don't know which people are infected or which areas are infected today, you just have to assume everybody is infected and everybody has to shut down, right? Same thing was going on here. You have to know where these are. If you don't know, then you just avoid it at all costs, which is what happens, which has happened the past two Thanksgivings, is that people didn't know which bags of lettuce had E. coli in them, and so they avoided them at all costs. These are pictures. This is actually a lettuce aisle um, in a grocery store. Just none, right? Well, this is what happens. The bubble, housing bubbles pop. Suddenly, houses start declining. It's not immediately by a lot, but in a highly leveraged system it is. Remember, like, if you're highly leveraged, if the value of your debt is much higher, is really big, it only takes a little bit of drop in price where all of a sudden your debt is worth more than your house. And so now you need to sell your house 
to cover your debts. But if you sell your house and cover, like if everybody goes and sells their house at the same time to try and cover their debts, now all of a sudden housing prices are going to go down further, increases the chance that you want to sell. It's just like, you know, it's this self-perpetuating system when these bubbles pop. You want to get out of that situation as soon as you can, but by everybody getting out at the same time, it causes this big collapse. And the problem with this is, just like with these bags of lettuce, these mortgage-backed securities, nobody knew which ones were the good ones and which ones were the bad ones. Which ones are going to be fine? Which ones should I invest in in the long run? And which ones are going to be terrible and they're going to lose me lots of money? So what do you do? You just run away from them. You do not invest money in them. You don't want anything to do with them. Investors lose all confidence in these mortgage-backed securities and everybody tries to get rid of them. What happens when everybody tries to get rid of them at the same time? Prices plummet. So like all comes together, right? That's what happens with the housing market. You have this big run up to the housing market. It, I mean, it looks just like the, the stock market crash in 1929. You have this big run up where people are using lots of debt to buy these assets. The assets are really highly valued. That pops. People try to sell at the same time and that drives the price further down. And so you get a crash, Okay. Just like the stock market crash of 1929, it happened, like we have, remember with the stock market crash of 1929, like it, it causes problems, but we kind of like start to get out of it. We think that we're fine. Um, we might have been out of it, but then it causes other problems. So Ben Bernanke takes the Federal Reserve chair in 2006. President Bush appoints him, and he's got a really different background from Volcker and Greenspan. Both of those guys, they had spent their careers in finance or in government. Bernanke is an academic. He was an academic. He had he was a professor at Princeton. Okay, Basically, had never done public policy in his life, but his life's work was studying the causes of the Great Depression and what the Federal Reserve could have done to avoid it. Like a lot of what we understand about the Great Depression today comes from Ben Bernanke's work. I mentioned some of his work in that lecture on the connections, like how people know something about the people they lend money to. That was Ben Bernanke. Okay? So he comes into this position with this understanding of the Great Depression and what the Federal Reserve should have done. 2007 is this trigger, just like crash of 1929, but it's not enough to push the economy into a full depression. Okay, the vulnerability was the shadow bank. It's like we almost get out of this. We almost, like the housing market crashes, but we almost pull out. We're almost fine. But then we have the shadow banking system that we don't know what's going on with a lot of these investment banks, and that again, like that's what happens in the um, the depression when people are running on the banks, people start running on these investment banks, which are not commercial banks, right? They're not insured by the FDIC. They don't have that much regulation. People start wondering if they can actually trust these systems. And the true push off the ledge for this recession was the fall of Lehman Brothers in September 2008. But to understand why that was so big, we have to look at the fall of Bear Stearns in March 2008. Bear Stearns was this large investment bank that was seen as this weak link. Okay, there's poor leadership. Um, it was very exposed to subprime lending. You know, this these mortgage-backed securities, like a lot of their investments were tied up in them. Oh, I oh no, I've got my question coming up soon. Don't worry. Um, it was it was big, but it was like the more important part was very networked. It had open trades with 5,000 other firms and it was part of 750,000 derivatives contracts. That means it was networked in with tons of other financial institutions. Okay. In March, 2008, Bear Stearns debt is downgraded. External agencies think, Hey, Bear Stearns might fail pretty soon. It's a risky investment. If they fail, they're not going to give you your money back. And so there's a run on Bear Stearns. People are like, Oh, Bear Stearns, not good. We're going to run on them. Not physically, like those pictures in 1907 where you have people just lining the street trying to get their money. But people are online. They're on the phone. They're taking their money out of Bear Stearns. The problem is Bear Stearns was not a bank that insured 
and they're not part of the Fed's mandate. They're looking for somebody to rescue them. They're looking for to come in. This is the Fed. They look to the Fed to lend money, and the Fed finally says, "Fine, we'll lend you some money." But this is a huge change. This is like the first time that the Fed is going outside of its system and lending to a shadow bank. This is really weird, but Bernanke sees this as a really important thing to do. Huge change. This is looking kind of strange. J.P. Morgan, the bank, named after J.P. Morgan, the man who comes in and saves the Panic of 1907, J.P. Morgan says, yeah, we'll buy Bear Stearns, but we want the Fed to help. And the way they get the Fed to help is by the Fed taking on like most of the risk. If this goes bad, the Fed is going to end up with the cost. If this goes good, J.P. Morgan is going to end up with all the benefits. Okay, Not a great term for the Fed to get into, but they see this as saving a financial institution that's key to the financial system. So that's what happened. Bear Stearns is about to fail. Fed steps in and helps Bear Stearns survive. Now we get to Lehman Brothers, which is like the same story as Bear Stearns, but with a different ending. Okay, But Lehman Brothers was twice as big as Bear Stearns. And it had the same problem of mortgage-backed securities, highly invested in the housing market. September 2008. Remember, Bear Stearns is March 2008. September 2008, Lehman is barreling towards failure People realize that you know there's run on uh, Lehman Brothers. Like this looks like Lehman Brothers is gonna crash. They call up the Fed and say, "Hey, we want to help." They try to help some. They try to help Lehman Brothers find a buyer, just like with Bear Stearns. But no one was willing to buy Lehman without a significant subsidy from the Fed. They they just they want the same deal J.P. Morgan got. Like, look, if you're gonna, we'll buy them if the Fed comes in and takes on all the risk. But the Fed doesn't want to, Bernanke doesn't want to keep ending up in the situation where the Fed is doing all these crazy things and they're always getting the bad end of the deal. And so Bernanke says, you know what? This isn't the way we're gonna run things. And he just decides to let Lehman fail. He's like, fine. We'll let Lehman fail. That's that's the way things are going to be. He underestimates how big a deal this is because this is a huge shock. Confidence just disappears and the crisis ramps up. Because the question is like, imagine being at this time and you're an investor and you see that the Fed stepped in and saved Bear Stearns. Why would you save Bear Stearns but not Lehman? Lehman Brothers was twice as big. Like if you're going to save... Bear Stearns, you have to come in and save Lehman. Now you're not saving Lehman. We don't know what to expect. What happens when the next thing happens? Or, you know, people are just scared to death and they start holding on to their money. And that's what really triggers the 2008 recession is people re- not knowing what is happening and them not willing to not willing to lend out their money. Okay, This is also what triggers... One of the best Easter eggs in animation. Boom! You see it? Bank of Evil formerly Lehman Brothers. I remember seeing this in theaters and just laughing so hard when they <laughs> when that came on the screen. Okay? Fun little Easter egg. Uh, Despicable Me came out in 2010. So, you know, it was under production when Lehman Brothers failed. So they put that little Easter egg in there. Okay? And that was a big part of what happened. I remember my parents... Uh, my parents sent me an email while I was out on my trip. They mentioned this failing. That was like the only indication I had uh, from home about how things were going. Um, Lehman's is turning point. This is a, a election betting market data. Um, what you can see here is, you know, Obama. Yeah, I mean, Democrats were pretty favored to win throughout most of the time leading up to 2008. There is a point where they get pretty close, but Obama is mostly 
holding a lead over McCain. But then right there is when Lehman fails and people realize, yeah, there's no way Republicans are winning the election like this. Um, I haven't looked at the betting market data recently. Um, Well, right now people are putting a pretty even chance on Trump winning the election. Interesting. So then you had all these bank bailouts. You'll he- you hear about these all the time. You have politicians ranting about them from 2008. Uh, they're talking about the they're talking about TARP. It's the Troubled Asset Relief Program. After the fall of Lehman, the Fed and Treasury they're just worried about the whole financial system. They're looking for a way to stabilize it. TARP was a 700 billion dollar fund the government used to inject capital directly into banks by buying stock in their banks. This is hugely controversial. Um, if the banks had caused the problems, why are they the ones getting rescued? Like you still hear these arguments today. You still hear these arguments about what's going on with, uh, PPP in the CARES Act, right? Like people are, um, today is totally different than what was going on back there, but you still have people using those same arguments today. Um, so the deal is structured in a way nine basis banks are going to participate because they don't want to stigmatize any bank that participates in it. Like this is just, we need to get money out to banks to make sure they have what they need to survive. But it's not free money. It's not like the government's just giving them money. Is it cheaper than what they could have gotten if they tried to lend on private markets? Probably, yes. But it's not free. Okay, They're still paying interest on this. And it turns out that they actually make money. The government makes money on the loans. Okay, Now you have to think about like opportunity cost and all that kind of stuff. But if you just want to look in pure accounting profits, the government made money off of nearly every loan that they did, except for trying to rescue the car companies, Chrysler and GM. They lost money on those. They make money because they lend money to these banks and the banks pay them back, okay? That is something that like people just forget a lot, is that the government made money off of this. They're not bailouts, they're not handouts, they were loans that were repaid with interest and the government made money off of them. So, what does the Fed do in the aftermath? Well, of course, the Fed's going to be start cutting rates. That's like one of the first things that you do. You lower rates by just putting money into the banking system. How does it do this? We've talked about open market operations in the past. Um, here's the problem. You want that money out into the system. You want people to have that money, and that money is going to be how people buy stuff during this recession. It only helps if that money actually gets to people. This chart right here shows you excess reserves from uh, like the 1980s. This is how much money banks have in reserve above what they're required to have, right? There's a reserve requirement. You have to have, is it 10% today? I think we've said you have to have 10%. Oh, today, literally today, it's zero, by the way. Banks don't have to have any reserves. That was one of the responses to what's going on today. Crazy. So, You have these, um, this is how much extra above that 10% the government had. And you can see like, uh, you can see like 9-11 in here where you have this big spike um, where people are like, oh, you know, we need to hold on to reserves. And they quickly realize, okay, it's not the end of the world. They get money back out to people. Um, But you've had, you know, kind of lower excess reserves in the 2000s than you did in the 1980s. This is what happens after 2008. And you know, what's crazy about this graph, where right here, this part right here, that is everything you saw in the previous graph, okay? Let's go back. This part right here is circled in red right there. You don't even see it anymore. That is nuts, right? Like I remember seeing this graph when I was taking economics, and this is just always re- resonated with me. We put tons of money out into the banks, but then banks weren't necessarily lending it out to people because this was just, they were just so scared they were going to fail. They were so scared that things were going to go bad. They wanted to make sure that they had money on hand. And then you have another problem that's called the zero lower bound. So not only is money not getting out to people, but you can't lower interest rates below zero, right? Like you hit zero and we had, we hit zero at this point. You can't actually go below zero. So how do you get more, how do you help the economy once you hit zero? Well, this is where we turn to unconventional monetary policies. These are things that we haven't done before. We have a question here. Um, 
let's see, has this ever happened before? Zero percent reserve requirement? I don't think so. I think this is the first time in at least in modern banking that we haven't had a reserve requirement. Uh, was that done to give banks incentives to invest in companies? Yeah, like they, you want to give people money. You want to make it really cheap for them to have money and to hold on to this money really cheap to get them to lend it out. The problem was they weren't actually lending it out because the fear of failing and not having money was greater than the benefit of lending this money out to get higher interest rates. So to get the economy moving again, the Fed has to come up with these new tools. We're going to have um, two... Oh, okay, good question. If there's a 0% reserve requirement, will there be bank runs? No, because we have deposit insurance. So that that's the bigger issue is deposit insurance. People run on banks when they don't think they're going to get money. Since we have deposit insurance, people aren't going to run on their banks. So we want to have quantitative easing and forward guidance are the two unconventional, unconventional monetary policies that we have. QE, quantitative easing, it's like open market operations. So op, open market operations, you buy treasury bills. In QE, you just buy tons of different uh, securities. Long-term treasury bills, you might buy corporate debt, mortgage-backed securities. You're going to just buy anything. This was the problem. This was to get around the problem of excess reserves. Like, okay, the banks are holding on to everything. Let's go directly to the businesses. Let's just buy things from uh, corporations and get them money. It was, it was very controversial. People, I mean, today we call what was happening just a few weeks ago QE5 um, because it's the fifth kind of unconventional thing that they were doing. Um, it seems to have worked. There's some evidence that this worked. Um, people think that the Fed should have done more of it. Others are still worried about the long run effects of what they did. I mean, uncontroversially, it changed their balance sheet. You don't really need to worry too much about this, but the Fed just holds on to a lot more assets today than it has. And people worry, like, what's going to happen when the Fed needs to get rid of these assets? And then forward guidance is another tool that they came up with, which was just telling people what the Fed was planning on doing. Remember, Greenspan was always really obscure about what they were doing. It didn't want to uh, give people too much information because they might overreact. Here, he's saying... Look, we'll tell you exactly what we're going to do. We're going to keep interest rates like this. Or we're going to keep doing this until we see this. Trying to be really transparent about what they were going to do so firms didn't have to think, oh, I'll make an investment now, but then what if the Fed changes something and then you know that changes the return on the investment? Fed was trying to be super clear. And the nice thing about this tool is it's costless. Like You can just implement it. You don't have to worry about inflation. You just say, we're going to be really clear about what we're doing. So the recession uh, officially ended in June 2009. Obviously, the recovery took much longer than that. There was debates up until, you know, last year. Hey, have we really recovered from what happened? Like, aren't there underlying things going on? Recovery took a pretty long time. Um, we see, <laughs> this is obviously a slide that needs to be updated. We seem to be in a pretty good position up until five weeks ago. Now, obviously, things are bad. Um, but again, the Federal Reserve is just acting with full gusto. And I think a lot of what the Federal Reserve is doing today can be traced back to what happened in the recession. And I think that that they are better off for that. They learned important lessons from what happened. And that, you know, people will say Bernanke did not act enough. Like Bernanke did lots of things, but he See, people think he acted too slow or didn't have as big of plans as he should have. Powell learned those lessons and he said, if that's what happened, we need to make sure that we're being aggressive, that we're responding. And that's why the Federal Reserve has just been really a standout player in what's happened in the past two months. That concludes our lecture on the Great Recession. We do have a lecture on Tuesday. It's kind of like the wrap-up of the class plus my parting words to you, this will not be a public linked lecture. Not everybody will get access to this. I will put, I will send out the link on Canvas and that's how you're going to get access to the lecture just because I share more personal things there. They're not, it's not going to be totally just economics related. We're just going to, it's going to be that capstone to the class. Um, the TAs will be sending an email out about the Kahoot pretty soon. There will be a Kahoot in review. The final starts one week from today. It will be open for more than 48 hours. It will be open for 
something like 56 hours or something, you'll have that um, that available to you. Great to see you guys. Let's see if I have. When did why did Bernanke leave? Bernanke's tenure was just done. He 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 served out his term. Like you can serve for a while, and then at when his term was done, he just said, "Oh, I forgot to put the question for the the watch party." Goodness gracious! I was gonna say, "What was your favorite animated movie?" I'm sorry about that. Favorite animated movie. There we go. Because I was gonna do it after Despicable Me, but I was worried about time crunch. Send me the watch party stuff. Love to see you guys. We will talk on. Tuesday. You're going to hear some great stuff. Thank you so much for being here. I know this is difficult. It's difficult for me too. I'm sorry for the stream today. Hopefully it'll sound like it ended uh, on a good term. Um, yes, people, I'll, I'll put in the chat right now as well. Um, there we go. It's there. See you guys next week.